Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Okay, I'm still learning to breathe at high altitudes here. So I'm a, so I'm a, I'm a particle physicist at uh, SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, the theory group there in Stanford. And so I could just start by just telling you a little bit about myself. We can just sort of get to know each other here for the first few minutes. Um, so I, I came into particle physics just as the Large Hadron Collider was about to turn on. So that totally shaped my mind about fundamental physics. And so a lot of my early, a lot of my early focus was on thinking about ways of understanding data from the Large Hadron Collider, how we could go about looking for new physics, for example, that could address the hierarchy problem or dark matter, again, at you know, a large accelerator. And that really shaped my thinking, and we'll probably come back to that a few times um, over the course of these lectures. And then from there, I spent quite a bit of time motivated by a string of sort of curious anomalies in data, kind of in the 2007, 8, 9 period, that motivated thinking about new kinds of dark matter and what, have, what has become known as the dark sector framework. And even though I'm a theorist by training, um, a lot of that work has led me down the path of actively collaborating very closely with experimentalists, in some cases actually just working on experiments directly, um, all in parallel with pursuing theoretical ideas and finding new opportunities for testing those ideas at existing accelerators and with new small scale experiments. And then there's another part of my, my interests that are not orthogonal to dark sectors, but they're, they're uh, theoretically much more removed, thinking about aspects of long range forces and tackling actually this not yet fully resolved problem of understanding what the most general long range interactions and forces are compatible with Lorentz invariance. So that's, that's another topic on its own. Not unrelated to dark sectors, by the way. Okay, so the, the lectures this week um, on dark sectors, Natalia Toro and I are coordinating them. So I'm gonna talk about aspects of the theory of dark sectors. And what I'm gonna try to do today in two lectures is talk about the uh, principal motivations, introduce you to the common theoretical framework that's used to, to describe dark sectors, as a setup for understanding their phenomenology. And I'm gonna focus on dark photons and the mediators particles, so not so much dark matter today. And then I'll pivot and spend more time on specific models of light dark matter, probably tomorrow and Thursday. I wanna be fairly flexible with these lectures, so I heard ahead of time that there's lots of questions and I've come prepared for that, okay? So depending on the questions that get asked today, That'll shape the lectures later this week, if that works out for, uh, for all of you. Okay. Any questions or comments so far? I haven't said much, so that's more of a, just a check. All right. Hey, good to see you. And I should start with an apology. So. I'll eventually put these lecture notes up online. It's gonna take a little while. Um, there are some important things missing. For example, I, won't, I don't have any references to papers in these notes, so I'll try to put those up as we go over the course of the week. Um, so I'll just apologize. Let's see, right now I'll apologize principally to Leontau and Stefan for not citing your work <laughs> in some of these lectures, so. All right. Okay, so on. The theory of dark sectors. Is that big enough? Great. Okay, so what are dark sectors? So the basic point of view, the basic setup here, is we have the standard model on the one hand, And I'll just I'll lump GR in there too, depending on whether you want to think of 
that is part of the standard model. Just lift this up a little bit. Okay. Now, so on the one hand, this is not a, the stuff that we're built out of, not particularly simple, comprises roughly 5% of the energy budget of the universe. I think this aspect has been talked about at some length, this fact that uh, we're a very small fraction of what's out there. Um, I'll go ahead and actually just write down to establish notation um, how I'm going to refer to the standard model, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. And then there's everything that is not directly charged under standard model forces. So I'm going to refer to these as matter and forces, not charged under the, SM, under the standard model. Okay. And of course, I'll say this over and over again, but the principal reason for thinking about this is that we have overwhelming evidence at this point that most of the matter in the universe is comprised of not the stuff we're built out of. One of the simplest explanations for why we haven't seen it in a very direct way is that it just doesn't carry standard model charges. It doesn't literally interact with us through, say, W and Z bosons and so forth. It could interact with us through W and Z bosons. Those are referred to as WIMPs. I think you've heard about that at this point. But, that's, but the other possibility is the one I mentioned. It's just not charged under us, OK? And any such matter and forces, I'm going to, from here on, just refer to as a dark sector. And of course, so there's plenty of motivations for thinking about this. The slightly better question, of course, is what motivates thinking about the presence of interactions that could connect such a sector, which very plausibly exists, with us? OK. So before getting into that, let me just establish a little bit of notation. So for this, for this lecture series, so the standard model, and I should ask, actually, have you discussed the standard model in detail up till this point? I was taking a look at the lectures on the Higgs and noticed some attempt at providing a survey there. But I think, is that, is, was that the principle? OK. OK, so we have on the one hand, we have the SU3 gauge interactions, SU2 weak interactions, and then U1 hypercharge. And then we have lepton doublets that are going to come in three flavors, labeled by I. I'm not going to make too much use of all this notation, but just to make sure we're on the same page. So those are singlets under SU3. They're doublets under SU2. They carry hypercharge minus a half. There's some convention dependence in how you do this. There's the right-handed lepton. Right, so this is a singlet. There's the cork doublets. Right, so these have the up and down components. So these are fundamentals under SU3, doublets under SU2, and then there's their hypercharge component, one sixth. And then the right-handed quark components. 
and if I put this correctly, one third. And then we'll also introduce a Higgs. So I left just enough room for that. So the minimal Higgs is a doublet. It's a singlet under SU3. It's a doublet. And you can carry ISIS bit in half. Okay. And then we have, of course, a three flavor family structure. And as far as we can tell, um, this, is, this is all we've directly discovered so far. The last component being what appears to be a fairly minimal looking Higgs doublet. Okay. WIMPs are, it's the short answer is no. Uh, the short answer there is morally yes. The distinguishing feature here, you'll see why. There's this, there's this division, I mean, by the way, I mean, there's, there's some other terminology that I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain to you. Sometimes people refer to these as hidden sectors, but hidden sectors mean something slightly different in the literature. Dark sector here means specifically matter and forces not directly charged under standard model gauge groups. So you'd see why an axion-like particle not carrying any charges could be classified as just part of a dark sector. Whereas obviously a particle that's charged under S weak is, is not that. Okay, so why, why, is the, why are there reasons to think about interactions like this? And so here, I think, and I expect uh, quite a few questions as we go through this, because I'm going to do this at a, at a bird's eye view. So there's a number of theoretical reasons that are quite old, things like the electroweak hierarchy problem, parity violation in the strong interactions or the strong CP problem. Uh, both of these motivate dark sectors. So I think you've started talking about naturalness and the electroweak hierarchy problem this week. But just for completeness. So I'm just going to go through these motivations. And they're not in ranked order. They're all kind of roughly on the same footing. But let's start with the classic theoretical puzzles. OK. So one of them is the electroweak hierarchy. And simply put, just as the name would describe, we have on the one hand, we have the weak scale, which I'll just parameterize with the Higgs mass, sort of in the 100 GeV range, 125. And then we have the Planck scale, which is 10 to the 17 H. Right? And then presumably, somewhere in here, draw it as a fuzzy line, we have new physics. I'm not putting it up here, but really it could live anywhere in here. This new physics, for example, you might expect in a UV completion of a theory of quantum gravity, um, or, or dark matter, for example, or other reasons. But the main point is that once you introduce new physics at a scale lambda, and it actually talks to the standard model, and this is important, it actually has to interact with us for there to be an issue here. If this new physics talks to the standard model, and in particular it talks to the Higgs, then the calculable finite corrections that you typically get from such new physics, just from an, e from an effective field theory point of view, induces corrections to the Higgs mass of order the scale of this new physics. 
And that tends to lead to the natural expectation that the weak scale, which is tied to the Higgs mass, shouldn't be too far away from whatever this scale of new physics is, okay? So the hierarchy problem is the problem that if you want to imagine this new physics is arbitrarily high up towards the Planck scale, you have to imagine some kind of fine tuning of parameters, which is fine. There's no inconsistency doing that. The theories were normalizable. You can do it. But it's a, it certainly presents a theoretical puzzle. It begs for a, an answer to the, to the why question there. Now, just one sec, I'll come back. So why does this motivate interactions with the dark sector? So typically, typically, ways of addressing the hierarchy problem involve introducing new degrees of freedom that are directly charged into the standard model. For example, low energy supersymmetry, theories of new strong dynamics, where the Higgs is composite, all of these typically involve new degrees of freedom carrying standard model charges. Now, in recent years, in part because we have not seen an explosion of, new, of, of such states at the weak scale, at the Large Hadron Collider, um, there's other classes of theories that people have been exploring where more of the action occurs with degrees of freedom that are not directly charged in your standard model. But nonetheless, to address this hierarchy problem, they need to talk to the Higgs. They need to interact with it somehow. And so the mass operator for the Higgs in these theories is typically UV completed into something that includes, of course, some bare mass term. But then there's additional states that will often appear. Okay. So attempts at addressing the hierarchy problem motivate thinking about interactions with the Higgs of this structure. And really, these are actually the kind of minimal set which degrees of freedom s, which don't carry standard model charges, can actually talk to the Higgs. The dot, dot, dot here are just UV suppressed operators. These are higher dimension operators. This is a dimension four operator, so that coefficient's dimensionless. This is a dimension three operator. That carries mass dimension one. So I've just truncated at dimension four. These are the only terms that you would expect to survive at low energy. OK, now let me come back. Um, so with the hierarchy problem, um, this mass difference or energy difference is relative, right? Like if the Planck scale were at 10 to the 50, then we would say, oh, 10 to the 17 GeV seems pretty close to 10 to 100 GeV. Does that make sense? I, I don't know that that's a fully formed question, but I guess the question is, why have we decided this is a large difference? Um, so perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm misunderstanding the, the question, but um, let me just let me just reframe what I'm what I'm what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say here. And I and I, I hope actually that in the lecture on naturalness, there's some examples of just finite threshold corrections to the Higgs mass that really make this concrete. So I don't know if Raman's doing that. But, um, but schematically, the point here is that, so the weak scale is what it is. We're just going to take it as a given. Just, let's just use this to sort of define some, some natural set of units for us. We're going to work in units of the weak scale. We know experimentally that there's another scale in nature associated with gravity. And Planck, and in units of the weak scale, it's roughly you know, 10 to the 17 such units. I don't know if that's a large number or not. It is what it is. And there's various reasons why we would expect new physics to kick in, for example, associated with UV completing GR in a quantum mechanical context, for new physics to kick in at some scale lambda, not too far from the Planck scale. Okay? And in perturbative models, where you can actually calculate things in, in reliably, in a particular course, where the word sort of finite threshold correction even has meaning, you can just calculate loop level corrections to the Higgs mass that come from this new physics, and you just quantitatively get a mass, mass terms that scale like this, this scale lambda squared. So if this is much, much, much larger than the weak scale, you know, you have to imagine that in the, in the full theory, 
as you're renormalizing, you'd have some, I'm going to call it um, mbear Higgs. So this is some parameter. Then there's some number, lambda squared. And then there's some counter term for the Higgs mass that we add when we normalize the theory. And essentially what you're, what you're doing is at the end of the day, you want this combination to be close to 100 GeV. But you naively have these perturbative calculable corrections in the UV theory that are huge. And so you have to actually just by hand tune, tune that away so that your renormalized Higgs mass is, is much, much smaller. And there's nothing inconsistent about doing that. I just want to emphasize there's no like, logical problem here. There's no mathematical problem doing this. But it begs the question, why would there be such a large scale? Okay, because you would just expect that any of these little finite calculable corrections would naturally would give you an estimate for where this scale should be, which is up here. And yet we're, we're pushing it all the way down to a lower scale. So there's other ways of talking about this, but at a sort of mechanical level, the way that people sometimes talk about fine tuning, this is literally what they mean. So there, there's a Wilsonian way of talking about this as well. Um, but I don't, I'm, I'm actually not sure that, has there, I don't think any of the lecturers have talked about effective field theory in, in that language at all yet. Yeah. So let's just, uh, let's just leave it at this. Is that helpful? We could talk more about that later as well. OK. So here's one motivation. Now there's another motivation that belongs, again, to the sort of classic theory puzzles of the standard model. And that is CP violation. So on the one hand, CP violation is CP is badly broken in the weak interactions, OK, famously. So so on the one hand, weak interactions break CP. On the other hand, the strong interactions allow a CP violating term. I think, I think you have talked about this. I believe Peter Graham talked about axions at some length. So this breaks CP. Um, if you introduce this term into the strong interactions, this implies that there's EDMs generated. So EDMs of, in particular, you know, neutrons and heavy atoms where the constraints are often the strongest. And in particular, I think for the neutron, this is roughly five times, I'll just put a number here just for completeness. Okay. But experimental constraints limit this to about 10 to the minus 25. So we know that this, if this term is present, present, needs to be smaller than about 10 to the minus 10. Okay. So this is the statement of the strong CP problem. Now again, there's nothing logically inconsistent with the standard model just having either an absent or very small theta term. Okay. There's no mathematical problem here. And in fact, if there were no other sources of parity violation beyond the standard, CP violation beyond the standard model, this would even be technically natural. Like there wouldn't be like large radiative corrections that would generate such a term. Okay. The problem is that in many extensions of the standard model, there are additional sources of CP violation. And in perturbative models where you can actually calculate things, there are finite corrections that are induced that generate such a term where, theta, where the theta is, is not particularly small. And in those models, you're left wondering why, at low energies, is theta so tiny? So the classic solution 
is essentially what I'll just, I'm just going to lump this into the dark sector class of, of, uh, of models. This motivates thinking about elevating this operator, introducing a dynamical field, which I'll call A. And so A is the QCD axion in this case. So A equals QCD axion. And dynamics of the axion potential that generates the axion potential implies that the combination plus A over F is small. OK, so there's a dynamical way of addressing this problem with the introduction of a new pseudoscalar that's not charged under standard model degrees of freedom. So that's just one example of a motivation for thinking about such states. And in particular, it's a motivation for thinking about them interacting with the standard model. OK, go ahead. Uh, maybe kind of a basic question, but um, So, so that is a good question. Um, so you'll notice that there's a mass scale f in this, in this interaction term. So this is a dimension 5 operator. So the way that you imagine these interactions arising are through degrees of freedom that directly, that, that can generate that term that talk to both the standard model and the axion. Such a sector with, for example, PQ symmetry where it may or may not be broken. Um, let me just ask, though, did Peter Graham talk about give concrete examples of UV completions of, of this operator? Because I'm happy to come back to that later in the lecture just to give examples. OK. OK. Because, I mean, by itself, this is a higher dimension operator, and all the effects of this are actually suppressed at low energies. And in particular, as you go to high energies, this theory by itself has needs to be UV completed uh, just to remain unitary to perturbative level. Those UV completions can be a little bit involved, but they're, they're certainly interesting. So I'm happy to come back to that later if you'd like. But moving on, so unification is another you know, classic theoretical goal that people have pursued over the years. This one really came into its own with the idea of low energy supersymmetry to address the hierarchy problem. Uh, I don't think anybody, well, most of the people in this room, I don't think, probably didn't grow up sort of uh, <laughs> eating and breathing this stuff. Um, just within the standard model, if you look at, say, gauge couplings as a function of scale, I'm going to just be very quick about this. They don't meet. Like, they just run to high, at, at high energies. They just run to values. Some of them have a Landau pole, like the U1. Others are asymptotically free, like SU3. If you add low energy supersymmetry, And it doesn't even have to be like especially low energy. OK, technically, this is consistent with uh, LHC data. Um, then you find that the gauge couplings roughly meet at a scale called about 10 to the 16 Jev. And they sort of roughly meet at a point if you extrapolate them from their low energy values. So for people who were thinking about unification and the hierarchy problem, this sort of appeared as a little bit like a miracle. And I think it added a lot of motivation for thinking about how the underlying gauge structure and the matter content of the standard model could arise from a unified theory where you would naturally expect this to occur. Okay, where you have some, some group up here 
at a high scale where you have SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 living in sub side inside of, we'll just call it a grand unified theory or a gut. Okay. Now I'm mentioning this because This set the stage for decades of model building, understanding how the standard model could arise this way. So there's minimal grand unified theories like SU5 or SO10, each with their own merits. There are others in more recent years. There's extra dimensional versions of these. Turns out the breaking of, 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 the, grand, of the underlying gut symmetry can be a little bit involved. So there's an interesting story associated with that. One of the things that naturally arises out of such constructions are, is the accidental gauging of, sorry, it's the gauging of accidental symmetries in the standard model, symmetries that appear accidental in the symmetry. So things like baryon minus lepton number. So I'm going to go over to this. If we've got the standard model notation established, I'm going to go ahead and just bring this board up. And so oftentimes, when these, when these larger unified gauge groups are broken, you'll get the standard model. And then you'll get extra, extra gauge groups. Often they're U1s. Just call it a U1x. One common U1x. So a common one is a abelian gauge group that's gauging B minus L. That's a classic one. Or just entirely new U1s, which in that case I'll just refer to as U1 dark. So I'm just going to, the D here will stand for dark, where it does not have to be associated with any accidental global symmetries of the standard model. These, for example, can arise, are especially natural in, uh, in situations where the gut breaking is associated with, with extra dimensions. OK, now, at dimension four, at dimension four, there's a very limited number of ways for such new degrees of freedom to talk to the standard model. Now, if, you ha if, it's, if it's an abelian U1 that's gauging B minus L, well, then it's actually directly talking to standard model currents. All right? So that's, that, that case is clear. But if it's a U1 that is not associated with some underlying global symmetry in the standard model, it's just its own thing, then there's essentially, there's essentially one natural way for such a U1 to talk to the standard model. Uh, which is just to mix with hypercharge. So I'll just call this F. I'm just going to schematically call this um, at low energy. What will matter here is that you have a field strength for the photon hitting a field strength for this dark U1. OK, just to make sure you understand what I'm writing here. So there's, this is the field strength F mu nu. OK, and I'll come back to this in a second. Now, non-abelian gauge groups also often come out of these constructions. Um, they're often also broken at higher scales. Uh, analogous mixing terms with the standard model are more severely constrained. And in fact, they don't exist at dimension four. They can arise at higher dimension. And that singles out this, uh, these U1 mixing terms as special. Okay. All right, so all of this is to say that in the context of unification, new forces that are not directly under the charge of the standard model can arise naturally, and there's a limited number of ways that those can interact with us. And in practice, in concrete models, they do interact with us. These terms are just generated. All right, a final, more data-driven motivation. <clears throat> 
I don't want to call this a theoretical, this is not a classic theoretical puzzle. I think if theorists had anything to say about it, we would have avoided this altogether. But the experimental discovery of neutrino oscillations, which imply that at least some of the standard model neutrinos actually have mass, rather directly implies that new degrees of freedom are needed to explain the origin of that matter and hence some kind of dark sector. The simplest explanations involve new degrees of freedom that are not directly charged under the standard model gauge groups. Okay? So just writing that. And to be very concrete, this is the bottom board, okay. So for example, if a standard model neutrino has a Dirac type mass, that can be explained with the introduction of some new state, n, which we'll just call n bar, which is We'll often refer to as the right-handed, a right-handed neutrino component. The underlying operator that it that it can come from is you have um, you have a Higgs neutrino coupling with a right-handed neutrino plus formation conjugate, and then upon electroweak symmetry breaking, you generate Dirac mass terms for the neutrino when you partner up n bar with nu, and then the other case that's often considered for Majorana, so that's where we have, this is probably too low, so I'll just, I'll go over here. Okay, so then the other case. where you have Majorana mass terms. A popular framework for explaining these is by integrating out a heavy right-handed neutrino where the underlying operator okay. So you have operators analogous to these now where, where the right-handed neutrino is heavy, you integrate it out. In that limit, this mass term for the right-handed neutrino, M, is coming from the propagator. And upon electroweak symmetry breaking, this generates a Majorana mass with very, very small value compared to the electroweak scale. It's sometimes referred to as the seesaw mechanism. Okay, so if these M bar masses are in, say, the MeV to EV scale range, and you have small Yukawa couplings, this is applicable for, this is often associated with the Dirac mass, with the Dirac mass case. Sorry, what's the question? Unreadable, minus 13, <laughs> just to give an example, okay? And if, the, if these masses are heavy, so say heavier than the weak scale, and we integrate them out, yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just write this out, I just said it in words, but um, if, these are, if these are heavy, you integrate them out, and via the seesaw mechanism, you get tiny Majorana masses. Either, either way, I and mean, this is not the only way that you can do this. There's a whole literature on model building in this direction. It's been around for many decades at this point. Either way, though, 
One is appealing to a dark sector to explain the origin of neutrino masses. And because you actually want to explain something involving standard model states, you are making use of an interaction term involving standard model leptons, new leptons, and the standard model Higgs. Okay? Now, actually, these, these have other interesting properties, um, cosmolo cosmology properties that can provide dark matter candidates, new sources of uh, lepton number violations, so you can explain matter, antimatter asymmetry, and they have interesting virtues. Okay. So the takeaway of all of this is that however you want to slice the last sort of 40 years of thinking about the standard model, dark matter itself motivates thinking about something like a dark sector. And then various theoretical puzzles or data-driven puzzles of the standard model motivate thinking about interactions with such dark sectors. And as I'll explain later, thinking about where dark matter could come from also motivates thinking about interactions between a dark sector and the standard model. So going back to this first board, Officially out of board space. Go ahead. So in the neutrino case there, these explanations of neutrino masses were relying on new, some people call them heavy leptons, some people call them right-handed neutrinos. They're basically fermions that are not directly charged under standard model gauge groups. So it's a, it's a matter state in a dark sector. Possibly. I haven't, I have not, I'm not aware of any especially theoretically compelling example of that form, but I wouldn't rule it out by any means. Okay, so if we turn this around, I've, so what I've done is I've, I've given you sort of some hint of how these classic theory puzzles motivate thinking about interactions with the dark sector. You could turn it the other way around though and just ask the question, okay, fine, so, if there is a dark sector and it has, say, new types of fermions or new scalars or new vector mediators, new pseudoscalars, I mean, you can just enumerate the list of possible particle types. You might ask that, okay, if we're thinking about interactions, what, what should we think about? It seems like if we wanted to be exhaustive or systematic, there'd be just a huge list of possibilities. You know, does anything go? And the answer is no. So I want to just run this in reverse. So given a dark sector with, I'll just list it. So scalars, fermions, vectors. I'm going to list pseudoscalars here as well. As well. We should have put that over. We can just list, list particle types. What kinds of interactions should we think about? And when I ask this question, I'm asking it from the point of view of being exhaustive and systematic, okay? Right, if you wanted to carry out a sort of program of studying dark sectors, how would you organize your thinking? Oops. And here is where we want to exploit what we know to the greatest effect. So there's sort of three key ingredients that we want to use. So one powerful tool, so you know, I'm going to just refer to these as severe constraints, severe theory constraints. So one is we have the gauge structure of the standard model. 
which severely constrains the kinds of operators that you can write down that simultaneously respect the underlying gauge symmetry of standard model interactions in the presence of interactions with new degrees of freedom. This ends up being by far the strongest constraint. There's, of course, also the symmetry structure of standard model matter. By that, I just mean you know, the, uh, the particle content that I wrote down and the fact that they fill out particular, that particular symmetry structure under the standard model gauge groups. So maybe you want to just consider this to be a subpoint of point one. And then we want to use guidance from effective field theory. And that, and what this really means is, is that we expect relevant and marginal operators will dominate. If we apply these three ingredients, then the set of operators that I already wrote down as particular examples are close to the exhaustive list. And this brings us to what people sometimes refer to as the portal formalism. Okay, I, I always find the term portal to be a little hokey, but um, but you know, when you draw this picture, you get the idea, right? You have a dark sector, you have the standard model, and then the, the allowed interactions are supposed to, you're supposed to think of these as experimental portals for testing these ideas. Really, these are just the allowed marginal and relevant operators that you can write down connecting the standard model to neutral states. wonder if this is just a feature of this eraser or the board. All right, well, forget that. I'll just ride bigger. OK. Okay, so in the case of, of vector interactions, I'm not going to be fully exhaustive here. I'm going to write down the, the uh, simplest versions of these. I want to check. Can you actually see this? Okay. So it looks terrible with all of the erasure in the back but, and my handwriting. The canonical way this is written is minus epsilon over 2 cos theta weak. This is the Weinberg angle. You'll see why that's a typical convention. So the prime, OK, so f prime mu nu is just the field strength. or what's sometimes referred to as a dark photon. Okay. And uh, B mu nu is the hypercharge field strength. Okay. In the case of scalars, it's what I wrote down before. So scalar interactions. This is referred to as the scalar portal. I'll use more canonical notation. The dimension three operator that allows you to connect to the Higgs will have a mass scale mu in front of it. S is a singlet. 
Okay, so H is Higgs doublet. S is a singlet scalar. Okay, so S is the degree of freedom that belongs to the dark sector. Neutral and standard model states these are the only dimension three and four operators you can write down the Higgs. Fermions. I'm just going to abbreviate this. So these are, this is referred to as the uh, neutrino portal. Has a, has a dimensionless coupling because it's mass dimension four. Then you have a lepton doublet partnered with the Higgs times a new state N. Okay, so in principle, there's flavor indices here that I'm suppressing. This L is the same L I wrote down for the standard model lepton doublet before. So this is the neutrino portal. And then, just to elaborate a little bit, if we were to stop there, this is close to an exhaustive list. For the allowed dimension three and four operators that you can write down connecting standard model degrees of freedom with neutral degrees of freedom. Scalars, vectors, fermions. Okay. There's typically one more that's included, which is actually dimension five, which is the pseudoscalar portal. And that goes beyond just the SU3 field strength coupling. So typically there will include, we can think about couplings to uh, the photon field strength FF dual. We could think about couplings. Obviously, there's the QCD axion coupling. There's other couplings to the chiral currents. So that's a mu psi. Okay, psi equals a standard model fermion. So there's chiral current couplings to pseudoscalars as well as the, and by the way, yeah, so this F, so these could be either, either U1 um, or weak SU2 field strengths, okay? So a couple of salient features worth pointing out. The vector interactions, um, because they don't directly involve standard model matter degrees of freedom, they don't know about flavor. They don't know about flavor violation. This will turn out to be important later. It'll essentially result in the experimental constraints being relatively weak for that class of interactions. Whereas uh, the other three, in principle, um, well, in particular, the fermion interactions, where I've just explicitly suppressed the flavor indices, as well as the pseudoscalar interactions, especially when you start coupling to chiral currents. Those know about standard model flavor. And in particular, if there's new sources of flavor violations, experimental constraints can be very powerful. Natalia may, may uh, comment more on that. Okay. But this is pretty much, this is pretty much it. There's a few other cases. Um, but they're not too dissimilar from, from, uh, from these. Okay, so any questions about this so far? Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and focus primarily, uh, I'm gonna start with the vector interaction case in large part because this provides very rich phenomenology much of which is relatively poorly constrained for one of the reason I just gave you, which is that it doesn't actually know about standard model flavor. So a lot of the powerful flavor constraints from B factories, charm factories, and so, so forth uh, don't apply. They also give rise to a variety of very simple models of dark matter, 
Yeah, I'll actually just I'll write this. And because they give rise to a rich phenomenology that can make a rather direct and simple connection to dark matter, there is at this point a fairly broad worldwide effort looking to constrain, either discover or constrain, interactions of that type. Okay. All right. Theory of dark vector interactions with kinetic mixing. Okay, so key points here. I just said it, but very rich phenomenology, as you'll hear a lot more about from Natalia. And especially important is it's the basis for a variety of simple models of dark matter. and relatively poorly constrained. Now, it's relatively poorly constrained, but not because it's profoundly hard to do experiments to look for such interactions. It's primarily because the field as a whole had a bit of a lamp, was suffering from a little bit of a lamppost effect of looking for new physics at higher and higher energy scales with order one couplings at experiments like the Large Hadron Collider and before it, the Tevatron. But in the context of dark sectors, for even modestly small couplings epsilon, the entire generation of experiments that uncovered the structure of the strong interactions and so forth, largely would not have been sensitive enough to see such an interaction, even if the new states were right, on, right under our nose, like literally at GeV mass scales, okay? So it turns out to be relatively straightforward, straightforward in quotations, to go back and do experiments to make a lot of progress there. Go ahead. Well, is the question, <clears throat> are there, is your question, are there others, or, or uh, are you looking for uh, a theorem that this is it? Um, I mean, so this, so, so the, the fact that this is close to it just comes from, I mean, I should, I don't want to call this a theorem, because there are slight variations, and there are simplified models that people introduce where you can couple vectors to standard model currents, okay, so instead of using kinetic mixing you have direct vector current couplings. And the way that works is you're allowed to do that at the EFT level if you couple the vectors, well, especially if you couple the vectors to conserved currents. Okay, so things like B minus L, which is one I mentioned, but you can also couple to uh, more exotic combinations like tau minus mu lepton number, mu minus electron lepton number, and things like that. And I left those out. So, I'm not, so it's not a theorem that this is all that's allowed at the EFT level. But these are, the, these are the operators at dimension three and four that are the simplest, arise the most often, and are the least constrained. The examples I just gave you there, with the exception of B minus L, which I don't quite put into the dark sector framework, um, because you're literally gauging a standard model symmetry in that case. Um, I, I think it's safe to say those are Building UV completions of those, the UV completions of those look a little more exotic. They're not so exotic that we shouldn't think about them. Far from it. But 
theoretically, you could put the you know, kind of one tier down. So I'm happy to come back to talking about those examples. And actually, Natalia may mention some in the context of, of, of the phenomenology. Uh, one class that gets a lot of attention is motivated from the G minus two of the muon anomaly. Uh, many of you may have heard about this. Um, that's an anomaly that also just motivated thinking about kinetically mixed dark photons. And, a, and for a dark photon in a mass range of, you know, say 10 to 100 MeV, and for an epsilon around 10 to the minus three, which can be motivated on independent grounds that I'll get to, that was a nice explanation of that. That has been tested. And there's a variation, though, of dark sector vector interactions that still works, um, where you actually have a U1 associated with uh, differences of lepton number involving mu lepton number. And that, that can still, that, that's sort of barely, it's, it's also being probed. And there's good experimental ways to go after that as well. So there are motivations to think about these other possibilities. OK. Any other questions? before we work our way through the vector interaction case through kinetic mixing. OK. <clears throat> so let's start. I think I've already introduced most of the important notation. But I want to write down, just for completeness, the Lagrangian we're going to start with. Okay, so let's put So the full Lagrangian is as such. So we have the hypercharge. So I'm mean, at first I'm going to write down the Lagrangian for the hypercharge part of the standard model. Okay. So B is going to be the hypercharge vector. This is the hypercharge current of the standard model. Okay. So just put an SM there to make that clear. So here's the dark sector uh, vector field strength. We will include a mass term. OK, so, so far these two sectors are just decoupled. And then we have just the one interaction term. OK, which is this kinetic mixing. So that's our Lagrangian. Go ahead. Um, and you said constraints here are weak, but do we have any way to be constrained in the dark photon mass? Yes. We'll get to those. OK, now the reason, the reason I wrote it this way, and you'll see this in the literature as well, is that upon electroweak symmetry break breaking, electro, oops, So upon electroweak symmetry breaking, as, as many of you know, the, the thing that we call the photon is a linear combination of hypercharge and weak isospin, OK? And so the hypercharge vector boson will go to cos theta Weinberg of the thing we call the photon field plus sine theta weak of the Z boson, okay? So here, just to be clear, 
AMU is now the uh, gauge boson. for familiar electromagnetism in the standard model. And Z mu is the Z boson of SU2. Weak, in particular, of, of the uh, neutral weak I suspend. Okay. So that means that this, this term here, the mixing term, I'm going to periodically suppress Lorentz indices just to speed things up. But if there's ever confusion, stop me and I'll reinstate them. This goes now to F, F prime. So now we have, so there's a photon, dark photon mixing is one piece you get. And then we have a second piece that's often ignored, um, which is, and here I'll go ahead and write indices uh, because I'm abusing notation a little bit. So z mu nu is del mu, z mu minus del mu, z mu, and this is the field strength of the z boson. So this, this is Z, dark photon mixing. Okay. Right, so we expect in the UV theory the mixing to arise fundamentally with the U1 hypercharge, just because U1 electromagnetism at low energy is a sort of derived surviving gauge group. So we would expect then mixing with uh, both the photon and dark photon through this kinetic mixing operator as well as the Z boson. Okay. Now, I'm going to start for a second by just ignoring this, okay? And we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I'll keep that board here. Okay, so usually, usually the way we would approach this, just like in any problem where you have either kinetic or mass, well, most of you are familiar with mass mixing, and of course usually what you do then is uh, either a field redefinition or rotation to remove the mass terms. Similarly, we need to do that here. It's not a rotation of fields, though, that removes those terms. It's a field redefinition. And there's two types that are often used to remove it. And they're completely physically equivalent, okay? But they, they highlight things more or less clearly depending on which basis you use. First is to take the photon field and just shift it by an amount epsilon involving the dark photon field. Or the reverse of this, which is to shift the dark photon field. into the photon field by a small amount. Okay. Either one of these field redefinitions will remove the kinetic term. Now, suppose we don't want to mess, so I'm just going to call this two, suppose we don't want to mess with the interaction term in the standard model. So where did I write it? Up here. Okay. So suppose we don't want to mess with this term. That would motivate not shifting the photon field, 
that would motivate shifting the dark photon field to get rid of that kinetic mixing. All right. So to preserve the interaction term, you can use two. <clears throat> and that implies, I guess I'll stop in two minutes here, <clears throat> and then we can just pick up after the break. This isn't the, the best stopping point, but let me just write one more line. So in this case, the Lagrangian goes to the diagonal and the kinetic terms. But then we have a mass matrix. OK, I'm going write to write it out, and then you could ask about the notation. OK, now, this isn't 0, literally. But I'm only going to work to order epsilon squared. OK, so there's a mass mixing. And then we just have the usual electromagnetic coupling involving the standard model electromagnetic current and the photon field. Okay. So this is one way to analyze the problem. And you're pushing all of the interactions now into mass mixing. And I think I'll just say the punchline, and then we can pick back up after the break. This should make one thing abundantly clear, which is that kinetic mixing by itself, in the absence of no other dark sector degrees of freedom that talk to the U1 dark, by itself, it is completely irrelevant if the dark photon mass is sent to zero. Okay? In the limit, the dark photon mass is sent to zero. Independent of epsilon, the mass mixing effects drop out. And you just end up with a standard model photon and a decoupled U1. Okay? Now, I want to emphasize that here because what's commonly done is, is to use transformation 1 to remove the kinetic term, okay, which makes the mass terms diagonal. It'll introduce an interaction of the dark photon with the electromagnetic current. But this fact that all the physics drops out when you send the dark photon mass to 0 will be fairly obscure in that basis, which is why I want to mention this to you now. But on that note, let's take a break. I think we're at 10.15 here. Go ahead. Do you want to do questions after the break? We can just, we can just hold questions later. Is that OK? Yeah, OK. It's, it's happened. Oh, sorry, how long is the break? It's a half hour. Half hour, OK. Yeah, so what you we're. Didn't get meal cards yet, did you? No, but I mean, no, but, but, um, um, I mean, you can give me a meal card, but so, Tuesday, I'm not Wednesday, sure, Thursday, I'm not Friday. sure I'll actually eat in the cafeteria because I, the thing is, I may just go back to where we're staying. Because of your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And like we've been doing dinner anyway. <laughs> Let me give them to you sure. as an option. If you don't use them, you can always give them back, but just in case you want to. I'm assuming these are. So if I don't use them, I should give them back, right? You should give them back. They okay. have some value. Okay. But if you walk over with the students to the cafeteria okay. one of these days, okay. it'll be good to have. OK, yeah. So the main time, I assume that the, uh, the, 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 the students are out. Like a, it's, it's lunchtime is their main break, and then there's these coffee breaks. And then they that's have lectures right. in the afternoon, right? So that, that, That's right. So the, the afternoon is like the morning. It's an hour and 15 minute lecture, a half hour okay. coffee break, an hour and 15 minute lecture. So there's a morning coffee break, a two hour lunch break, and an afternoon coffee okay. break. OK, all right. Well, I'll just I'll make my during the break as much as possible. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Hey. Sure. Just so I understand what you're saying here. 
So it's obvious to me to make this choice to uh, dark photon mass goes to zero. I have no interaction, that's fine. And so.